Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 4, Part 2. Before we begin reading, allow me to ask you some questions so that you can think about while you read. Number 1. What fantasy does Johnny keep having in his mind? Number 2. What changes in the Laugham household does Mrs. Laugham decree? Decree meaning, what well, does she make happen like a, like a tyrant? Number three, what does Johnny learn about Rab? What does he learn about Rab? And what does he learn from Rab? So two, kind of a double question there. And number four, what does Rab lend Johnny? And why does he do that? Here's part two on page 80 in the blue book. Although Johnny might have been more cordially received by Merchant Light, he was satisfied enough with his welcome to build up air castles. He really knew they were air castles, for at bottom he was hard-headed, not easily taken in even by his own exuberant imagination. Still, as he trudged up Fish Street, turned in at the Laugham's door, in his mind he was in that ruby coach money, and a watch in his pocket. He had hoped to slip to the attic and fetch away his cup without being noticed, but Mrs. Laugham saw him enter and called him into the kitchen. She said nothing about his shoes. Evidently the girls had told her his story, and she had believed it. Johnny, you come set a moment. No, girls, you needn't leave. I want you to hear what I'm going to say. Johnny looked a little smug. Had he not, almost, arrived in the light coach? Grandpa says, as long as he lives, you are to have a place to sleep. But you've got to go back to the attic. Mr. Tweedy is to have the birth and death room, and you can have a little somewhat to eat. I have agreed that that's all right. I'll manage somehow. Don't fret. I'm going for good. I'll believe that when I see it. Now, mind, I have two things to say to you. The four girls were all sitting about, hands folded as though they were at a meeting. First, you shan't insult Mr. Tweedy, least not until he has signed the contract. No more talk of his being a spinster aunt dressed up in men's clothes, and no more squeak pigs. He's sensitive. You hurt his feelings horribly. He almost took ship then, and there back to Baltimore. I'm sorry. Secondly, there's to be no more talk of you and Scylla. Don't you ever dare to lift your eyes to one of my girls again. Lift my eyes? I can't see that far down into the dirt even to know where they are. Now you saucebox, you hold that tongue of yours. You're not to go hanging round, Scylla giving her presents, and dear knows how you got the money. I've told her to keep shy of you. Now I'm telling you, you mark my words. Ma'am, I wouldn't marry that sniveling, goggle-eyed frog of a girl, even though you gave her to me on a golden platter. Fact is, I don't like girls, nor, with a black look at his mistress, women either. And that goes for Mr. Tweedy, too. He left to go upstairs for his cup. When he came down, the more capable women of the household were out in the yard hanging up the wash. Scylla was paring apples in that deft, absent-minded way she did such things. Isana was eating the parings. She'd be sick before nightfall. Scylla lifted her pointed, translucent little face. Her hazel eyes, under their veil of long lashes, had a greenish flash to them. There never was a less goggle-eyed girl. Johnny's mad, she said sweetly. His ears are red. He's mad, Isana chanted. These words sounded wonderful to him. He was happy because once more they were insulting him. They were not pitying him or being afraid of him because he had had an accident. Goggle-eyed, sniveling frogs! With his silver cup in its flannel bag, he set off to kill time until he might take it to Mr. Light. He spent a couple of hours 
dreaming of his rosy future. And the tears in Merchant Light's unhealthy, brilliant black eyes, the, the tremor in his pompous <laughs> manner of speech as he clutched his long-lost whatever-you-are to his costly waistcoat. Even if he did not like women, Miss Lavinia, he decided, was to kiss him on the brow. Through this dreaming, he felt enough confidence in his good fortune at last to stop in to see that rab. There had not been a day since the first meeting that he had not wanted to. Rab showed no surprise either over his return, or the strange story that he proceeded to pour out. It was nightfall, and, as Johnny hoped, Uncle Lorne and the little webs were gone. Rab was waiting for the ink to dry on the observer so he could fold it. He sat with his long legs stretched before him, his hands clasped behind his neck. Light's crooked, you know, he said at last. I've heard that before. He's sly. When the merchants agreed not to import any English goods until the Stamp Act was repealed, he was one of the first to sign, then imported secretly, sold through another name, made more money. Sam Adams spoke to him privately, scared him. He says he won't do that again. He's trying to ride two horses, Wig and Tory. Johnny's life with the Lathams had been so limited, he knew little of the political strife which was turning Boston into two armed camps. The Whigs declaring that taxation without representation is tyranny. The Tories believing all differences could be settled with time, patience, and respect for government. Rab, obviously, was a Whig. I can stomach some of the Tories. He went on, men like Governor Hutchinson, they honestly think we're better off to take anything from the British Parliament, let them break us down, stamp on our faces, take all we've got by taxes, and never protest. They say we're American colonies, are too weak to get on without England's help and guidance. But Governor Hutchinson's a good man. Of course, we'll destroy him. We've marked him down. Sam Adams is already greasing the ways under him. But I can't stand men like Light, who care nothing for anything about, except themselves and their own fortune, playing both ends against the middle. I have never have picked him for a relative, but beggars can't be choosers, and happens I'm a beggar. It's on to time to get ready to go to him. Understanding Johnny's unspoken desire not to appear too meanly before the great gentleman, Rab went to the attic above the shop where he slept and came down with a clean shirt of finest white linen and a fawn-colored corduroy jacket with silver buttons. It's too small for me. Ought to about fit you. It did. Almost miraculously, for Johnny had not seen where it came from, bread and cheese were on the counter. It was his first food since yesterday's gorging. With the straight, fair hair well brushed, and tied behind with taffeta, the handsome jacket, the frilled, immaculate shirt, Johnny did cut a very presentable figure. By the printing shop clock, the sun had been set for almost an hour. Rav was folding newspapers. You can sleep here, he said, if they don't offer you anything. But good luck, bold fellow.